Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's Mayhem by For All Secure program, powered by the TechStrong Group. My name is Jared Harris, and I'll be your host today. We've got a great, pa a great program ahead of you, but before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping notes. <clears throat> today's program is being recorded, so if you miss any of our dis discussion or you'd like uh, to recommend it to a friend um, or, or watch it later, uh, you will receive a link after today's recording, so feel free to also stick around. Make sure you ask some questions in the question box. Uh, that's on the right side of your screen where you'll also find a chat tab um, where you can interact with the other audience members, tell us where you're from, and just kind of poke around and, and see what's going on. Um, let's see, we've got, uh, we've got the handout section as well. Uh, we've got, uh, in the chat section, we've got a survey for you. If you want to let us know at the end of the program, uh, what you thought, give us your, um, ideas on what we can do to improve. And then finally, we've also got, um, two $50 Amazon gift cards. So whoever is the most engaged and, and does mention something in the survey comment or gives us the best survey comment, we'll be reaching out to you afterwards. So let's go ahead and kick off today's program. We've got beyond the S bomb understandings and mitigate your attack service. We're joined today with Josh Thorngren, uh, VP of Product at For All Secure. Josh, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off and let you take it away from here. All right. Sounds great. Thank you, Jared. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, appreciate you taking the time to join today. We're going to talk about S-bombs. And we're going to talk about a little bit about where they came from, why you're hearing about them, why you're using them, if you are, um, and talk about some of the ways that we could improve upon them, go beyond where they are today, both from a process and a technology standpoint. Um, before we get into that, though, you know, let's just let's just kind of set the stage. Let's let's talk about what you're going to learn today. You know, let's break it down. So, you know. In, in, in the theme of what we're talking about today, I, I created a presentation bill material. So I've got 24 slides. Here's, here's what each of them talks about. Um, and, you know, if you're like me, you might be looking at this and saying, well, oh, that's, a, that's a lot of information. It is. We're going we're to get back to this in a second. Um, but, you know, first things first. Who am I? So I'm Josh Thorngren. Once upon a time, I was a developer. I made the move over to, you know, what I affectionately call the dark side, marketing, product. For the past 15 years, I've been marketing and building DevSecOps products. So figuring out ways to help accelerate how fast we ship software, while also making sure that software is safe, reliable, and performing. Right now, I lead the product team as well as the marketing team here at For All Secure. For all secure, a little bit about us. We're a hacking organization that turned into a cybersecurity company a few years ago. Um, we make a platform called Mayhem. It does generative behavior testing for apps and APIs. It goes after exploits and to tell you the ways that attackers could, you know, actually hack you instead of just giving you a laundry list of CVEs. But we're not actually gonna talk about Mayhem today. We're gonna talk about SMOMs. And we're gonna start with what is an SMOM? And one of the ways I talk about this, and one of the ways that I hear my customers talk about this is, it's the ingredient list. Okay, you're cooking a, you're cooking a recipe. The SBOM is the list of things that you need in order to make that dish taste wonderful. Now, I do have a small caveat. I was hungry when I created this deck. And so you're gonna see a lot of food examples and analogies sprinkled through that. If you're hungry right now, I'm sorry for making you more hungry. Um, and if you're not hungry right now, I no promises on, you know, the end, the end of this talk. Um, but getting a little closer to, you know, cybersecurity, DevOps, et cetera. Another way to think about an SBOM is it's an asset inventory for AppSec. If you think about cloud security, if you think about network security, endpoint security, all of those have a concept of tell me the posture of all my assets. Give me the inventory of all my assets. And we haven't really had that in the AppSec. We've had a lot of things around understanding the risks in those assets, 
or understanding an application as a monolith, but not really a good concept of what are all the ingredients that went into this finished product. So why do we care about these things? Well, th this is something that I think kind of gets, I hear a lot of people talk about a order of operations here and an order of operations where, hey, there was a rise in supply chain tax to talk about solar winds, talk about log for shell. Oh, and then because there was a rise in supply chain tax, there was an executive order and US federal guidance on increased transparency into software supply chain and a definition of what a software build materials is. I think these things, they're related. There's some causality there, but they're not necessarily, you know, a one, you know, number one led to number two. What we've seen more broadly is organizations everywhere are reusing components, largely open source, but also commercial, because it accelerates how fast they can ship software if they're not building every single layer and customizing every single layer. Of that. And what that means is you've got things you didn't build mixed in with things you did build, mixed in with tools you use to do the build. And that creates a lot of information sharing across multiple software vendors, you know, community maintainers of open source projects, commercial vendors selling software, teams developing custom code in-house. They all need to really communicate effectively on what the risk posture is, but even beyond the risk posture, what's the posture of that application? What's the ingredient list? And so that's sort of the market dynamic that has led both to the supply chain attacks, the lack of a shared understanding led to a lack of understanding of the risks and defense against attacks, the rise in those attacks, and the importance of reusable components for accelerated delivery led to guidance coming from the government on, hey, here's how these things should be used. And here's how, you know, here's how government agencies at least have to be transparent about their software supply chains. And what I've seen over the past couple of years in talking to customers, both uh, in the government and in the commercial sector is there's more attention being paid to this than a lot of other cybersecurity guidance that previously had come out. And it's not, that's not solely, oh, look, a uh, new executive order, we have to comply with it. It's because there's a real world problem that that one was created to help everyone, public and private alike, start to solve. So, you know, as part of the executive order, there was a definition um, released alongside it. What's in an S1? Well, breaking it down, it's not, there's not a ton of, you know, you're not, you're not going to be surprised. Hey, who created this thing? What's the thing called? If there's a unique identifier, hey, include that too. What's the version number? How do we know if this is the latest version or old one? How does this component relate to other components? What are the dependencies? And then how did this entry in the SBOM get created? And when did this entry in the SBOM get created? That's sort of the core minimum definition. Um, what I think we've seen over the past few years is SBOMs get used in a number of different ways and the information that gets associated sometimes can vary a little bit, but at its core, this is the sort of minimum requirements. Like, tell me the provenance of all the things. You know, it's not just the ingredient list, it's, well, here's the ingredient list, but here's when this, you know, turnip was grown. I had a turnip soup last time, it was lovely. Uh, That's good information. Okay. I know what versions, what components I'm using. I know what relies on what other pieces. But it's really interesting how this is starting to get used as SBOMs become kind of a new de facto standard for application posture visibility. Um, I have talked to you know, I say, I say 90 plus, I, I, 
I was run, I was running through my notes today. I think it's 110 plus, but I've talked to a lot of folks over the past four months on how are you using this most today? What has either federal guidance, if you're in the government, or the rise in supply chain tax and the federal guidance and the rise of SBOM technology, what has that changed for your organization? How are you using SBOMs today and how are you not using them? And I heard some common themes about what they're actually using SBOMs for. And then I heard some even more common themes on where the gaps are today. And so what I'm going to talk about next is we'll dive into some of the use cases and how, how these work, and then talk about some of the reasons that these use cases have friction. And from that, hopefully we can move into a little bit of what we can do to solve it. But I ask everyone is like, hey, if you're using SBOM today, think about think about how you're using, think about different things as we talk through some of these use cases. And you know, I've got some questions to that. So the first one and one of the biggest ones is security. So what we saw with something like Log4Shell was organizations spent their time trying to understand were they impacted and if so, where. And that significantly increased their risk exposure and it significantly increased the blast radius of successful attacks because they couldn't identify compromised systems. They couldn't identify entry points. They, they didn't know where they were vulnerable. And so having that SBOM saying, well, here's where this component is used across your application stack, it allows them to get ahead of the next type of attack by setting the teams up for effective triage and thus faster remediation. The other piece though is teams are trying to try and use SBOMs to say, okay, well, what components do I have so that I can just, as part of my normal dev process, go, you know, patch, remediate vulnerable ones. And that can take a lot of different forms. It's say hey, upgrade the list. It doesn't have this CV in it. It's can we remove this? It's, is there a mitigation we can deploy elsewhere in the application? But it's starting to operationalize SBOMs the way that we've seen SCA tooling, SAS, um, those types of tools shifting left onto developers. Hey, let's take this and let's turn it into a security app line for you. So that's our piece one. And what's interesting is this is maybe the one where I've heard most people complain, but it's also the one where I've heard most people say like, we're doing both of these things today. So the other one is patch management. And I, spoiler alert, not, not the type of patches on the slide. Um, but effective patch management is really difficult. Like any, any, any technical debt problem is difficult. Hey, how do you invest in this? How do we prioritize cleaning up outdated code versus shipping new features? Where I've heard organizations talk about deploying an SBOM to decent effect is using the SBOM to just vet what's old and use that to then prioritize technical debt work in the backlog and bring that into sprints so that they've got a patch management program that's a little more agile, low, has a little higher velocity because the component information is being piped into developers. And so starting to use this for patch management versus trying to have some sort of like operationally driven large scale patch management program, it's, it's a little more of a lightweight approach, but what I've heard from teams is this, this is helpful. The third piece, and this is one that I, out of these big three, this is one I hear the least frequently, but you know, I think it's so important. And, you know, I don't know where this, I don't know where the sign is from, you know, if it doesn't allow either dogs, wolves, or just foxes, but, you know, I, I wouldn't want to live there. You know, it looks like very, very cute, adorable dog, wolf, fox thing, but hey, compliance, compliance with regulations. So SBOMs help provide visibility into licensing information. What are we using in our organization? Teams can then leverage that to make sure that their team, their, you know, dev team, what they're shipping to their end customers 
matches what they are legally required to disclose, to comply with, you know, what license usage they have, and reduces some of that corporate risk that as teams get larger, starts to be more and more important. So more and more, I've also heard about SBOMS as being a compliance mechanism for license enforcement and reporting um, that risk teams are using even more broadly than driving sort of security or technical fixes. Um, there's, there's kind of big three that I hear the most. I, I am curious though, like for folks today using SBOMS, like, does, they, does anyone have any, like, hey, are you using these in any different ways? Is there anything else where you've got a use case that isn't one of these? Um, you know, drop it in the chat, you know, ask a question. I'd, I'd be curious to know. And if, you know, it's both like, hey, like, how can we talk about that a little bit today? But also, this is still an evolving technology. And so I think there's a lot of room for different use cases to crop up as SBOMs continue to see more use. You know, I, I talked about kind of friction with security and everyone I've talked to, I said, well, that sounds helpful, but, and it's, and it's always that side. It's always that, but, and what we hear are sort of three things. One is too noisy. And, you know, as well, as like, one of the things that's interesting is there's not necessarily a consensus on how recursive you go. You know, if you're using containers and you know, you've got a, you know, operating system layer, well, do you go include every package that comes with that operating system in the SBOM? What about the dependencies of those packages? Like, is that useful? Is that not useful? Is that relevant? Those types of questions, like, You'll hear different opinions, but an SBOM is everything. And what that means is this can be a lot of noise, especially if we're trying to use it to drive action. So the second piece, though, is around the context. And any, any tool anywhere that says, well, here's, here's a picture of your application has some degree of this problem. And it's, well, sure, that's in the application, but the way I'm deployed, no, but the way it runs. But if you look at the code, the context of where something is used and how it's used, what type of connectivity does it have? What other services does it interface with? This isn't included in this problem. And again, like, that's not inherently a problem with SBOMs. That's not how they've been built. That kind of leads to the last point here. And this is the thing that I've heard almost exclusively from engineering leaders I've talked to when I ask them, like, hey, like, you got any concerns about how your organizations are starting to use S bombs? And they say, yeah. I'm being asked to go update everything that's updated in S bomb. I'm being asked to go resolve all vulnerabilities in known vulnerable packages in the SBOM. I'm getting SBOM results now as a gate in addition to my SCA results and my SAS results. There's teams are starting to try and drive action based off of SBOM reports. That's, you know, the same things we're driving in other tools that have similar outcomes, similar outputs. And so what I hear a lot is we've operationalized SBOMs without really understanding how to operationalize them. And so I want to kind of go back to my you know, presentation bill over materials redux. So like, look, I, I don't know about everyone here, but if I take these 24 things and consolidate it down into, here's what you're going to learn today. Here are the categories of stuff we're going to talk about. One of these things is a lot more useful than the other. And it's not that the first one doesn't have value, but 
the clarity of information and the context provided by the second gives you a better understanding about what the topics we're going to cover are in this presentation. And so I share this because if there's a common theme that I hear from folks, it's we're trying to use SBOMs for things that require more tailored, more filtered information in order to be action. And um, Alex, Alex, I see your note in the chat about like using SBOMs as a supplement uh, as a part of documentation. Yeah, totally. Like that's such a good use case. Hey, here are the open source components we include. Hey, here's what our stack looks like. Here's how our software leverages these different licenses. That's something, you know, every everyone I've sold to, oh, well, what open source is in your software? Oh, well, you know, what other licenses, you know, if we run this in our environment, what do we have to worry about? That's what really solves problems like that. And so, you know, I, I kind of think about like, how are we using SBOM today and what do we need to do differently to resolve some of the challenges that SBOMs present, but get all the benefits that they can provide. And so I think about process changes um, first. And so like, where do we need to go beyond the processes we're using around SBOMs today? And again, like I wanna focus in on a few areas. And the first is be an index, not a map. And I think the, you know, I think the compliance use case, the licensing use case, this is a really good example of that. It's here's the list of things that you need to be aware of. It's not the turn by turn navigation that says, okay, and then go do this and then go do this and go take action here and go take action here. The SBOM orients what you're looking at. Okay, here's the full scope of components and it allows you to focus work. Well here are the things that are in our application itself, but it's not trying to give you the direct guidance on how to plan out a route, how to plan out actions. And so anytime when I talk to folks that are starting to say, hey, you know, we just start generating an SBOM, you know, every time we do a release, and now we're going to use that to patch everything, remediate vulnerabilities, keep our software up to date, I start to get really leery because that's jumping to action before really understanding the contents of your index. So that's the first shift. Like, let's treat it like information, not actionable information. And the second thing is start right and fix left, but don't shift left. And like I look, I'm a I'm a I'm a DevOps guy. Like I I probably mutter shift left in my sleep. So like you're not going to hear me say don't shift left much, but with SBOMs, like, this is a way to understand the ingredients that went into software, the components that are at every layer of your supply chain. And so with what we have today, just those lists of components, those indices, shifting that left into earlier stages in the build to drive some sort of faster loop to remediation, it starts to lack the whole picture and lacks the benefits of being that complete source of information. And it doesn't necessarily engender faster remediation, faster patching, faster fixes, because you're not getting the contextual information of what's important or what's not. And so we have to really avoid the classic DevOps AppSec urge to say, I have this new report on my application. Let's put it in the CI CD pipeline. Doing that with an SBOM, it's just adding noise to a developer's workload. The third thing we have to be careful about is we have to have some like, wait, really? Conversations? And I, I you know, this was the only like person looking surprised stock art I could find it. I don't know. I don't know why, but I guess, I guess it's almost you know, the Santa season. Um, one of the things that I think we have to start doing with fast bombs is having like, wait, really conversations and a few teams I've talked to, not a, not a lot, but a few teams I've talked to 
they've been using the SBOM to drive some conversations about architecture. And well, why are we including this? Do we still have a need for this? What's the purpose? How does this benefit us? And using the SBOM to force some hard conversations about how to simplify. And, and it's interesting because I heard this the most from teams that sometimes don't have as much of the processes and automation built out. And so I think they're, you know, for doing more like hard conversations, but this is a really important thing about the SBOM is if you don't know why something's there, that's probably an opportunity to invest in and potentially remove it. And the more components you're able to remove, the more you're reducing your risk surface, the more you're simplifying your architecture, the more you're starting to focus in on how do you deliver functionality with the minimum number of underlying dependencies and thus the minimum underlying number of risks. And so when I look at today's SPOM reports, I think one of the things that we're really missing and one of the things I've heard teams being really happy with is starting to use SPOMs to force some conversations about how we build and what we've built and how we need to resolve tech debt by simplifying. And so that's that's sort of the third thing as far as like, hey, how do we go beyond what we're getting from your Cyclo DX report today? Like really why do we need this type conversation to start to use that to drive action versus the report itself so those are just the three themes about like hey what do we need to be careful of as we are using s bombs today and what are some things we can do to extend our process and prevent us from turning us bombs into just a source of noise, but not a source of action. And again, this is, you know, going back to those three use cases from earlier, this is why I think there's so much friction in the security one, because the AppSec is really about finding the things that need to be remediated. And so when AppSec teams start to try and operationalize SBOMs, you end up with friction points. You end up with go do a thing, and it's another justification to be written. And that's just adding more work and slowing down dev velocity. So there's another piece here, though. And the other piece of this is not the, how do we use SBOMs in our process, but it's, is what we have from an SBOM standpoint today sufficient? And if it's not, where do SBOMs need to evolve and change? And I mean, I'm, a, I'm opinionated on this. I have opinions about most things. But I think what's also really interesting is in speaking with security leaders and speaking with tech, tech and leaders, none of this was controversial. All of this was like, yeah, this is where this is where SBOMs need to evolve to. This is where this type of reporting needs to really move towards. And on, on one hand, it's really encouraging. On the other hand, well, we got we to gotta go make it happen. So let's talk about what that is. So first thing is runtime aware. And so, okay, and again, we're back to the food thing. We're back to the food thing. I, I, I managed to like not have some food slides in the middle, but yeah, we're here. So runtime aware. And this, and this is the thing. If you say, hey, there's chicken. Well, if it's raw chicken, that might be a problem. If it's cooked chicken, well, okay, that's a little safer, you know, hopefully, hopefully. But the state of the final product, how it's used, how it's deployed, how it was built, what hardening it went through, what temperature it was cooked at, that has a huge impact on risk. And so when you're using an SBOM to understand risk, when you're using an SBOM to understand attack surface, or even when you're using an SBOM to prioritize how you go tackle the next log for shell, the state of your applications and the products of your supply chains as they run 
That's really, really important. And so that's not technology. We need to start finding ways to make it runtime aware. The second piece is it needs to be opinionated. Notice this isn't just a recipe for macarons. It's a recipe for perfect macarons. Well, here's the thing. Lists don't drive action. What comes next is important. And if we think about an SBOM today, we think about here's the version of this component. What we're not thinking about is here's the version. It's three versions behind. There are five more critical CVEs in this version than there are in the latest. You need to patch this. Now, you can, you can say to me, Josh, yeah, of course we need to patch it. But when you Deploying dozens of times a day when you're continuously integrating software and when you're getting hundreds of results from your security tools, your SBOM tools, every single time you check code in, you don't want to do the triage. You don't have to go figure out what do you remediate first. You need integrated opinions that say, okay, if we're going to drive action off of an SBOM, if we're using this for something that's not being an indice, how do we actually drive action and be opinionated about what that action is? It's the recipe. It's not the ingredients. It has to go beyond that. The third piece, and, and again, like, you know, the food thing kind of falls apart here. It's a, it's a, it's a Mobius strip lemon peel. I'm very proud of finding this one. Um, but Right now, the big thing that I see with fast bombs is it works really well when it's a indice for what's in your application, what's in your supply chain. It works really poorly if you try and shift it left to either drive action or get upfront visibility. Where this needs to go is something that's continuous. And you're starting to see some evolution here where you know, you're looking at like a pipeline bill of materials almost where it's, hey, what's coming in at various stages in the pipeline? How are, you know, how is different code being integrated? What checks are happening? What steps are being taken? You know, what version conflicts do we see? But it's building up and building down. So you build up the SBOM as you add things into your application stack, as new layers are put into your supply chain. And you filter those back down as your application runs. And all of a sudden, well, we don't actually use this thing we added. And so this, this is where this starts to look like a little, a little more like classic observability or a little more like how we think about, you know, say cloud security or network security with a, sure, tell me all my assets, but show me the behavior of those assets so I can understand what needs my attention for mitigation or remediation. And right now, that's the piece that's missing, the continuous loop of the SBOM of not just here's the things that I included, but if we're really going to take this technology and turn it into something that makes us safer, it needs to have here are the things that I'm using out of the things that I included and giving that context and that visibility to the folks who have to go mitigate, who have to go remediate. Because otherwise, they're still bogged down in triage. They're still bogged down in, well, do I trust my SA report? Do I trust my task report? Do I trust my SBOM report? And like, if anyone in the room is a dev, like, you know, like, no, you don't trust any of those. They all have too many false positives. They have too much noise. You just have to write justifications all the time. And so we need to really strike all the irons hot to build SBOMs into something that's continuous, that's runtime aware, that says, hey, Here's what this component needs from you so that we're turning this into a posture and behavior tool, not just another way to send a list of things over to developers and say, hey, have fun, enjoy. So that's sort of the third thing where we really need to evolve the technology, how it integrates, how it's used, and what it's actually doing beyond just those name version, dependency, unique identifier, those categories. Kind of summing it up, SBOMs are informative, 
but on the balance, it's information, not context, which makes them not necessarily actionable for some of the use cases that they're being forced into today. And again, it's not all of the use cases. Like, I think there's a wonderful compliance use case. I think they are a wonderful indice. And what I hear from teams that use them like that is, yeah, this is great. This is easy. In the near term, though, we have to shift how we're integrating SBOMs into our process to try to focus on what they're good at, on generating that indice, generating that list, giving us that visibility, giving our customers that visibility. And stop trying to fit SBOMs into, oh, this looks like a list of things to give to a developer, so let's go do that. We have to make that shift in the near term. Otherwise, there's not going to be the adoption of SBOMs as an action, actionable thing in any way, shape, or form. But then innovation has to follow because we can and should applaud the progress that, like, public sector, private sector, everyone's taken towards supply chain visibility, standardizing formats, saying, hey, we're all going to go do this so we can all be safer together. But at the end of the day, commonly reused components get reused in different ways. And one person's attack surface isn't you know, isn't the company next doors. And so there has to be more innovation on the SBOM, both from a, hey, do we operationalize this? Do we shift to left? But also from a security standpoint, hey, how do we use this for improved MTTR? We have to drive innovation of SBOMs and observability. Getting those bound together to unlock value of SBOM as really an AppSec posture tool and an AppSec behavior tool all in one. So that's what we've got, you know, where we're at today, where in the near term, I think we need to start making some shifts in how we approach SBOMs um, and where in the long term, we need to work together to see the market evolve. Um, if you have questions, if you have feedback, drop in the chat, drop in the q and If you hate food analogies, let me know. This is, this is my first time running through this presentation. So, you know, you're like, hey, that was terrible. Hey, slide 20 was great. Hey, slide 13 was the worst thing I've ever seen. Like, let me know. And, you know, if you want to talk SBOM stuff, drop me a line. All right. So Josh, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, did the executive order have any impact on the outside government increase SBOM usage to increase uh, SBOM usage? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good one. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. When I, when I talk to folks outside of the government, they say no. No, like, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's useful, but it's not really, you know, structured guidance. And I say, okay, are you using those bombs? And for the most part, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we totally are. And I don't think that, I don't think we would have seen the market adoption had there not been the federal focus on it. Um, but it's, I think it's, I don't have anything that's directly tying an impact together, but I, I find it hard to believe there wouldn't be any um, impact there. Okay. I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but if you want to explain a little more, um, should the SBOM replace other tools for security? Uh, not, not at this stage, no. No, it's, and, and I think this is one of the mistakes that people make is they're trying to like shift an SBOM into a development workflow and say, oh, well, you were using Sneak to, you know, understand your open source usage and vulnerabilities. So now we've got SBOMs and say, hang on a second. Like that, that's where I'm starting to see a lot of friction and a lot of frustration around us. Okay. Um, we've got someone also said that their friend works for a big firm. They tend to use Gen AI for S bombs, including they find um, and resolve their programming issues, how they find and solve their programming issues. However, the risk uh, causes several security gaps and could get misleading information. What do you suggest regarding um, S bombs around AI. Oh, so I think like 
I think one of the really interesting things about how we're starting to use generative AI tooling is we're using it to save human time on tasks and like using it to build an SBOM or to parse through an SBOM. Like th those are both really good examples of applying AI to a human task for time savings. And one of the one of the things that I've definitely seen and you know I've experienced this myself using some of generative AI tools and I've talked to a lot of devs who see the same thing is you know if if all you have is a hammer everything's you know everything looks like a nail. And what tends to happen a lot of times is we use something like generative AI when a simpler way of automating the human aspect would have worked better and had less risk. And you know, to get to give an example of this, like one of the things that I've seen folks start to do is, well, hey, let me use generative AI to look at my code and based on what I've written, tell me what's actually going to run and what's not, and then use that to help filter down. And sometimes it's an SBOM, a lot of times it's, you know, a security report. Hey, you know, how do I, how do I exclude some CVs? How do I do some quick triage? And, you know, to the point in this question, like, sometimes information there isn't right. And I think that's a really good example of like, we're over automating too fast. And what I think is a safer approach is maybe you don't start by trying to get everything, by trying to do the best type of automation. How do you start by actually, and again, this is why I use the example of observability earlier on, like get the observability of what you can see about an application as it runs and use that. And sure, maybe you miss some things that are used, you just didn't see them, but you can trust all your results. It may not be every result, but it gives you the ability to prioritize based on verified things before moving on to others. And I think that's a, I'm not saying there aren't holes in that approach too, but I think that tends to be a safer and ultimately a more scalable approach because you can build up from there versus always trying to worry about what the gaps are that a uh, AI model might, might leave you. So just to continue along on that, what's your um, opinion on SBOM in the generation for projects with long release cycles? Is that something that um, you can value for generations in each step of the S SDLC? So, I think it's important to know how they're going to be used. You know, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to come out hot and say, no, S bombs only when you ship the final thing, but there's a good reason to have S bombs for different environments and S bombs for different stages of applications, especially ones with long release cycles. And I, I, you know, I think about some of, some of our customers that I talked to today who, you know, work, you know, in IOT, you know, electric vehicle type scenarios where development cycles are longer, test cycles are longer, and there's a large number of safety concerns that come into play as well as your classic cybersecurity concerns. S-bombs are important at multiple stages there. The thing you have to be really careful of with having S-bombs in multiple environments is how are you using those? Because if you're using a dev SBOM to prioritize things that should be changed, patched, updated, but how you build and the artifact you end up with in production doesn't match what's in dev, you might be burning cycles that you don't need to be in. So that's the, that's the piece that I would have concerns about just running into that and saying, oh, hey, guess what? We're doing... We're doing S bombs in different environments without thinking through how do you use them in each environment. And then, 
Have you have you ever considered how VEX conversions could help with some of the context of, of S bombs? So I you know, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, like I don't know the most about how teams are using VEX to get the, get vulnerability context into you know into or alongside S bombs. Ultimately, I like and and now I'm starting to kind of speak forward. Okay. Ultimately, what S bomb is doing is a superset of what we see from software composition analysis tool, and it's not that it's a superset of the information at this moment, but it's a superset of the broader use cases. Um, how do you understand what's in your application? How do you understand the layers? How do you understand the dependencies between those layers? How do you understand the versioning, the vulnerabilities, et cetera? I think being able to marry in um, vulnerability context in a SBOM standardized format is an improvement and having the SBOM formats be relatively standardized in and of themselves makes it a better place to surface that information. Having said all that, I think one of the problems that I see today is organizations that say, hey, we've appended vulnerability data to our SBOMs. And now we're using that to get developers to go fix things. And it's not actually solving any problems for devs. And so again, it's it's the type of thing that I think is necessary for the right evolution of SBOMs. Um, I think today, again, if you operationalize it today, you you risk a lot of friction without a necessary benefit over what a lot of teams use uh, day in day out. Okay, so if it, yeah, if, if anyone else has any more questions, go ahead and, and submit them. Um, we've got one more so far. Uh, so while we're waiting, if any more come in, Josh, do, do S-bombs, uh, do, do the S-bombs format make a difference like the SPDX or the Cyclones? You know, it's, <sighs> no, like I, I could give, I could give a very technically nuanced answer. Um, the, the short of it is there are, there are a few different formats right now. There will likely be a few different formats for a while. At the end of the day, they're all ultimately, you know, I think they're all ultimately JSON esque artifacts, but it, no, not at this point. All right. Well, if you don't have it, or if you have any final remarks, um, since no other questions have come in, go ahead and give them. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and close out. Just, you know, big thank you to everyone. And um, yeah, I, you know, any, any feedback, hit me up on LinkedIn, drop me a note, joshforallsecure.com. And yeah, thank you all very much. Hope it was informative. Um, the jokes landed at least halfway decently and that you, Y'all have a good rest of your morning, evening, afternoon, or night. Cheers. All right, Josh, that was outstanding. Um, comments and and people even said so. So good job. I uh, just want to thank you for taking the time to to share your expertise with us. And uh, as a quick reminder for everyone, today's session was recorded. Following the panel, you'll receive an email to access the the recording. Um, you can also go to the devops.com website, go to devops.com slash webinars. You can go to the on-demand section and uh, find it there and, and, and watch it if for some reason the email doesn't come to you. Um, so finally, just before we close out, I do want to thank Mayhem by For All Secure for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, and I also want to thank each of you again for uh, uh, attending us for the entirety of the presentation. Please take a moment to fill out our uh, survey. You can find it at the top of the chat section, or once we close out, you should see a pop-up on your screen. Um, again, thank you for joining us for today, and we hope to see you on our next upcoming program. My name is Jared Harris, and I will be signing out.